Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. I'm Ertuğrul Çimen, the chair of IFLA Europe Regional Division Committee, and currently I'm working at MEF University, Istanbul, Turkey, as the library director. Today, we will talk about information integrity and the role of libraries in Europe. The first step for this inspiring activity was the joint idea of IFLA governing board member and the director of the library's development local government management agency of Ireland, Stuart Hamilton, and Sherry Aldis, the director of the United Nations Regional Information Center in Brussels. I want to thank Stuart and Sherry for making this event possible. The theme of the session, information integrity, is regarded as a highly important issue, not just by the IFLA, but also by the United Nations. In, in this contest, context, the United Nations Secretary General, already in 2021, highlighted the importance of information integrity as a key consideration of success in wider policy efforts. This work is advancing rapidly towards publishing a United Nations Code of Conduct on information integrity in the coming months, which will address mis- and disinformation, hate speech, and protecting ourselves and our communities from harmful content. On February 9th, a splendid article on information integrity through the eyes of the United Nations and UNESCO was shared on the IFLA blog page called Library Policy and Advocacy. I strongly recommend everyone to read this document. It's worth remembering that libraries have long focused on how to ensure that users can access high quality information and the skills to appreciate and use it. This experience and expertise, as well as their reach, reach across societies, makes them powerful potential partners in advancing this agenda. In that light, the, this event is doubly important in that it is the first in a series of six regional workshops. Today, Four valid panelists will share their opinions on working together for information integrity, the role of libraries in Europe. In this first installment of the series of six regional workshops, we will focus on the questions. What does information integrity mean? What are the key issues and questions behind the upcoming United Nations Code of Contact on the topic? How are libraries impacted by myths and disinformation. What can we learn from each other to counter this? How libraries can realize their potential to contribute at all levels to building a healthy information environment? Before moving, moving the speeches, I would like to remind you that you may send your questions, comments, or suggestions by adding them to the Q&A box. We will answer all the questions at the end of the session. Now, I leave the floor to panelists and hope this will be a beneficial event for all of us. Our first speaker is Paul Kilkenny. I would like to finally to share with you his resume before letting him start his presentation. Paul is a senior policy analyst in the Online Safety and Digital Regulation Unit in the Irish Government of Tourism, Culture, Arts, Gaeltech Sport and Media. He is a part, part of Secretary managing the development of national counter disinformation strategy. By an independently chaired multi stakeholder working group comprising representatives from a range of government departments, academia, industry, and civil society organizations. Paul has previously worked in the Department of pu Public Expenditure, National Development Plan Delivery, and Reform. Prior to working in the Irish civil service, he has over 15 years of experience in managing research funding development in roles with the Irish Research Council and the Technological University of Dublin. Paul holds a BA in legal studies, a, a MA in media studies from Technical University of Dublin and a, a MSc in economic policy studies from Trinity College, Dublin. Paul, floor is yours. 
play make your presentation. I say you're muted, Paul. You are muted, Paul. My apologies. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you very much to Stuart Hamilton from the uh, the Local Government Management Agency for inviting me to participate in this conference, and also to Stephen, uh, who is uh, facilitating my slides today because I'm having a little bit of te technical difficulty. Um, so ho hopefully this will this will uh, proceed smoothly. Um, Stephen, if you maybe want to move on to the the first slide. So. Um, Ireland is developing a national counter disinformation strategy uh, in response to a recommendation from the Future of Media Commission, which was established uh, by the current government uh, some years ago, uh, I think around 2021, to explore uh, a range of issues in terms of um, the sust a sustainable media environment into the future. Um, so their report was published in 2002 and they made a recommendation in relation to disinformation. The commission said that there is a need for a more coordinated and strategic approach to combat the damaging impact of disinformation on Irish society. It was considered that the, the existing initiatives uh, that span a wide range of disinformation types and policy areas, coordination would be useful to ensure cohesion in our response to this problem. Media regulation is a complex area which needs a suite of measures to deal with harmful content, as well as illegal content. The strategy that is in development will work in tandem with recent and forthcoming legislative measures, such as our Domestic Online Safety and Media Regulation Act, as well as the European Union Digital Services Act to ensure the broadest possible regulation of this wide ranging sector. Our Online Safety and Media Regulation Act came into force in March of 2023 it provided for the establishment of an online safety commissioner who will develop regulation on online service providers. This will be done primarily to the creation of binding online safety codes. It is intended that these codes will minimize the availability of some of the most serious forms of harmful content online. This new commission, Commission Numan, as it is pronounced in Irish, will also host the Digital Services Coordinator, which has a role under the Digital Services Act in terms of tackling uh, disinformation from a systemic perspective. Legislation, however, is not enough. Education and media literacy play such an important role for people in recognizing false material online and helping to prevent its dissemination. Existing media literacy initiatives have supported digital literacy amongst Irish citizens and are a key tool in Ireland's response to disinformation. And libraries will have a key role in assisting with this a uh, very important tool in combating disinformation. Stephen, can I ask you to please move on to the next slide? So, um, a, a working group was established um, in uh, February of 2023, which coincided with the establishment of the new Media Commission, who are also a member of this group. But as you can see here from the list of membership, it comprises a wide range of government departments, but also academics, uh, researchers, civil society organizations, and the platforms represented by an umbrella group called Technology Ireland, who are a representative body that uh, engage with government on behalf of the um, platforms on a range of public policy issues. Next slide, please, Stephen. So uh, once the uh, group was established, um, it decided to look at kind of key three areas and bring in additional expertise to explore specific, to explore these areas in order to come up with some sort of uh, rubric or structure for developing the strategy. So the first group looked at map mapping existing initiatives that are uh, taking place domestically and also on a Europe-wide basis. And the second group was looking at the existing and emerging regulatory environment to see what gaps there might be and, and, and whether this would be in, uh, informative for the development of the strategy. And the third group was tasked with looking at ways in which we can support a free, independent, high quality journalism sector and protect public interest information. Next slide, please, Stephen. 
On foot of the exploration of those three subgroups, the working group uh, devised uh, uh, a structure involving five key principles, uh, which would inform further consultation with uh, the public and with experts um, in terms of de uh, developing an overall uh, cohesive strategy to combating disinformation. So these uh, principles are as follows. The first is counter disinformation, protect freedom of speech using a rights based approach. Um, this would consist of being uh, measures to counter disinformation, must hold, uphold a, uh, right, human rights, including freedom of expression. Um, it also recognizes that all members of society should be empowered to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas, while acknowledging that the right to freedom of expression must respect the right of others to privacy protection from discrimination, and to data protection on the GDPR. And the second principle is counter disinformation by building resilience and trust at individual and societal levels. Aspects of this principle will uh, strive to ensure public access to trustworthy and reliable public interest information, empower people with skills and knowledge about digital media and information literacy, to be able to make informed choices about the media they consume, create and disseminate in a critical, creative and responsible manner. And also promoting diversity and plurality of information and access to high quality ethical journalism by regulating and supporting the media sector. The third principle, um, which will be looking at cooperation, collaboration and coordination, um, will be looking at the sharing of best practice, horizon scanning and facilitating new collaboration and projects. One example of this is our involvement in the OECD uh, Myths and Disinformation Hub, which has recently published a very interesting report and has three principal, principles of its own. The uh, title of that report is Facts or Fakes, Tackling Disinformation by Strengthening Information Integrity. The fourth principle will be looking at countering disinformation through accountability and regulatory enforcement. So measures uh, for this principle should um, look at the new digital media and platforms um, and help to spread information more quickly than ever before. Measures to counter, to counter this should be enforce and, and incentivize the lawful use of people's data, ethical business models, and preventing digital platforms recommend or algorithms from amplifying hate and hysteria in people's video and social feeds for commercial gain. And the fifth strategy will be looking at um, the area of research ensuring that there is an evidence-based environment, that countermeasures should be based on robust evidence and an evidence-based uh, approach. Key, st key stakeholders um, in, in tackling this research um, will involve both researchers in academia and uh, in civil society. Key stakeholders need to access a well-maintained evidence base to provide in-depth awareness of disinformation trends, bad actors, narratives, and tactics across different platforms, as well as international developments. Next slide, please, Stephen. So um, a key part of this strategy development is consultation with the public and also with expertise. And we engaged in um, a full written public consultation exercise in September and October of last year. And we received almost 500 responses to that. And on foot of the outcomes from that public consultation expert, uh, uh, ex, uh, uh, that consultation exercise, we conducted a separate forum of invited experts and civil society organisations to look at some of the uh, suggested recommendations from the public consultation. Next slide, please, Stephen. So on foot of the consultation, some key uh, um, themes have emerged for the development of the strategy. Obviously, there's the need to connect, protect freedom of expression, the importance of plurality of information and development of critical thinking sk skills, and the need for robust and effective regulation and corporate accountability. Next slide, please, please Stephen. Um, some key issues now which the working group are tackling with in terms of specific uh, measures that need to be taken in this strategy is 
how do we ensure that there is robust enforcement of the Digital Services Act, including effective regulation of recommender systems and our algorithms and their damaging effect in uh, promulgating disinformation narratives? They are also looking at uh, examples of cradle to grave media literacy and, and research. The Finnish model is very instructive in this regard, and also looking at how to augment fact checking activities and pre bunking. In terms of both consultation exercise, there has been a, uh, a keen uh, focus on community engagement, and we think that libraries will have a key role in implementing the strategy here. And also one of the key international aspects of disinformation is the role that it plays in terms of election uh, integrity and the damaging role of foreign information manipulation and inf interference. Tracking trends in relation to this will be very important in terms of uh, quickly identifying disinformation trends and tackling them accordingly. Next slide, please, Stephen. So just where we are at in the process now, we have just completed a series of bilateral engagements with uh, government departments on potential recommendations, and we've begun detailed drafting of the strategy. We we're hoping to agree a set of recommendations with the working group in early, 20, in early April uh, 2024. And once the working group um, are, are, are in agreement with the proposed approach, the proposed strategy will be presented to government for approval at the end of April 2024. So that's the end of my presentation, um, and I look forward to uh, discussion and questions in due course. If you want to find out more information about the development of the strategy, um, the website is available here, and I will be passing uh, my slides on to uh, colleagues in uh, IFLA uh, if people wish to um, uh, avail of them. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation, uh, Paul. It was very inspiring for me. I'm sure that all the audience really liked your uh, presentation and uh, the information you shared us. Our next uh, speaker is Sherry Aldis. Uh, before leaving the floor to her, I would like to share her short bio. Sherry is the director of the National, uh, of the United Nations Regional Information Center for U Western Europe in the Department of Global Communications since February 2022. From 2015 to 2022, she was Chief of United Nations Publications at United Nations Headquarter in New York, overseeing its publishing activities and strategic partnership with the publishing industry and academia. Before joining the United Nations, uh, Sherry had an ex extensive career in international publishing and marketing. She is Canadian and fluent, English, fluent in English and French. She has Master's of Business Administration from University Paris de Fond, I hope I pronounce it correctly, and the AIAE of the Sorbonne and has lived in the UK, Canada, France, Tunisia, USA, and now in Belgium. Sherry, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Erta Gruhl, and thank you to everybody for being here to talk about this very important topic. I'm grateful to have this opportunity to be with everybody today and um, will share my screen to show my hopefully short presentation to all of you. Um, so Information integrity is a shared concern. It's something that concerns all of us as individuals, as citizens, and certainly a shared concern between IFLA and the United Nations. We've had many conversations on this in the past and ongoing conversations, and I'm really happy that we're, we're going to be having this discussion in this series of webinars around the world. There are lots of entities working in this area. As you know, we just heard Paul speaking about the Irish example. There are regional entities. We have the European Union in this space and also international entities such as the United Nations. It's a global issue. It's a complicated issue and it does require a global solution and it requires a whole of society approach. So really there's something for all of us to do in this area. And so today we're really focusing on libraries and information integrity. We know that libraries are impacted. I would almost say they're on the front lines. Um, it's an overflow from global conspiracy theories and organized groups around the world. 
think that libraries are targeted physically. We've seen that in many instances, including in Ireland and also online. Libraries are targeted for many reasons, but also because they're a threat. They're a threat to lie mongerers and they're a threat to information manipulators. So this is quite a powerful position. It's a recognition in a way of the key role that libraries play in this space and that libraries are a very important part of the solution as we combat this very unhealthy information ecosystem that we're currently in. So libraries provide and have provided for generations access to reliable information. There's also a physical presence in communities around the world and libraries are an essential part of the fabric of many communities and a place that people come to in order to find reliable information. It's, you know, I think recognized as a source of reliable information. And it's also an important relay for media and information literacy. So it provides a place where people can have access to tools and to information of all kinds. And it's a physical space that can also be used for active training and media and information literacy. I think that's something to explore as well. And then this very important notion of trust. So people trust libraries. That's something that means something today in this environment of so much distrust. And so I think there's something very important to leverage there as well. So the United Nations is also very active in this space. There's a need, as I said, for a global framework and that is the UN's role here. We started to work intensely on this during the pandemic when we identified mis and disinformation really as a life-threatening challenge. And it felt like it was really our responsibility to find a way to really impact positively on, this, um, on these issues that we were having, that we were seeing come up that really were jeopardizing people's lives. So one of the things that we did is we developed a campaign called Verified to flood the internet with truth and science and push out the facts. We use this, um, we push this out using local influencers. So in the languages that people speak, in the places that people are looking for information and with really trusted partners, it was pharmacists and local doctors or religious leaders and librarians. So that was a, a really important part to be able to just counteract some of the really toxic information that was coming out. And then the other component to this was the pause campaign, which you can see on the screen. And that pause campaign is really about improving media and information literacy to giving people the skills and the tools to teach them to take a moment to pause before they share information. And what questions do they need to ask themselves before they do so? So this worked, it was very impactful, and we decided to intensify our work in this area. We've since expanded it to work on conflicts and climate. There's a lot of climate disinformation out there that really is really impeding us from achieving the results that we need to in terms of climate action and conflicts. We see this in Gaza, we see it in Ukraine, all of the, the mis and disinformation that is at play, the information war is rampant. And so we are very much working in those spaces as well using similar techniques. Um, and it does have an impact on our work, a very serious impact. It affects all of our work. It threatens progress on the issues that we work on, which are fundamental issues to all of us. Things like peace and security, as I mentioned, the conflicts that we're having at the moment, just increasing division that costs people's lives. Also in human rights and climate action, we have a lot of um, enablers in the climate field in particular. We have the, the fossil fuel companies, we have the advertisers who are all lobbying against the action that we want to take in climate. And much of this is based on false information and lies. It also affects our operations on the ground. So I'm sure you all know we have massive peacekeeping operations around the world. And in a recent survey, more than 70% of our UN peacekeepers said that mis- and disinformation either severely or critically affected their ability to carry out their mandates. And there has been loss of life linked to local disinformation of our peacekeepers. I think it's useful just to take um, a step back and, and look at the terminology for a minute. Um, Paul referenced this as well. There are various terms that we use when we talk about what we call information integrity. We deliberately chose positive terminology because we want to aim for a healthy information ecosystem. It's also all encompassing. And we think that that's very important because there are so many terms that are used. There's a difference between, for example, mis and disinformation. There's a difference in terms of you know, disinformation being intentional and misinformation being less intentional. Hate speech, which is illegal, 
content is different again. And then we have this terminology that the European Union uses quite a lot, which is foreign information manipulation interference or FEMI, which is only talking about foreign information manipulation, but there are other bad actors who are also in this space. So we really wanted something that addressed all of these different components of the topic. And again, we wanted something that had a positive um, connotation. So what are we doing? Um, so we're drafting a code of conduct for information integrity on digital platforms. And the intention for this is to be a gold standard, to set a standard at the bar very high for member states, so for countries, governments, policymakers, for the platforms themselves, and also all other stakeholders. So that's countries, as I said, the media, um, Paul also referenced the health, the importance of having a healthy media, independent media. So encouraging that digital platforms, of course, and then the enablers such as the advertising industry, but also academics and all of us individually. So these recommendations are firmly grounded in human rights laws and principles. That is the absolutely foundation, the foundation of all of this is our human rights law. And that's that can be a slippery slope. If we start looking at content, if we start looking at, um, at reducing people's access to information or right to freedom of expression, then that becomes very, very serious and bad actors can leverage that. So we really want to make sure that we are firmly grounded in human rights laws and principles. So the recommendations are grouped around sort of three key areas. The first one is about disincentivizing online harms. So this is about you know, taking those business models, discouraging those business models that the platforms have that profit from the spread of hate and lies and holding those actors to account. Um, it's also about encouraging alternate revenue streams. So not just sort of the negative part, but also the positive part. There are other ways of generating revenue and other business models that allow us to embrace user safety and privacy. The second big um, group of recommendations are around transparency. So understanding, if we understand the mechanisms that are used to target us and that enable the spread of information threats, it helps us to combat them. And part of this is very much about granting access to researchers so that we can all benefit from the research that they do using the access to the data that is on the platforms. And the third part is about empowering internet users. So this is very much about media and information literacy, about equipping people with the skills that they need in order to discern truth from lies, and to be aware of the algorithms that are targeting them. As we know, this is becoming more and more challenging with um, artificial intelligence, but it is still possible and there are many tools and techniques. And I'm sure that Davina will speak more on this as well. And then the other component of this is of course, having a better understanding of how personal data is used and how do we identify and respond to mis and disinformation and hate speech. So just to give you a quick idea of the timeline, we did publish a policy brief that sets out the principles that we're working on uh, in May, 2023. The code of conduct will be published this June. We're in the process of finalizing the consultations. We've consulted very, very widely on this, including with IFLA, which is extremely important to include uh, librarians viewpoints in this document. And it will be presented at the Summit of the Future in New York in September at the General Assembly to member states. Um, we know that we're at a critical moment. Timing is key. It's good, I think, that we are bringing this out at this time. This year, we have many important elections around the world, including in the European Union and many European countries. We know that mis- and disinformation is absolutely rampant and increasing. And we know, again, that artificial intelligence will only make it worse. It's going to make it very hard to identify what's true from what is false. We do have some tools. We have, as I say, our code of conduct, but this is a multi-stakeholder approach. We also have the EU regulation that Paul referred to. The, we have the Digital Services Act, the Digital Markets Act, and the Code of Practice on Disinformation. And there's also some new legislation coming into force, <laughs> excuse me, specifically on transparency in elections, which will also provide some additional uh, protection to, to citizens. So it really is crucial to have these guardrails in place from various angles in order to protect our institutions and our democracies. And so again, the UN's code of conduct will contribute to this ecosystem at a, a very timely moment when we really need all hands on deck. 
And then finally, what can we do together quite concretely? As I mentioned, IFLA has been contributing to the, the code of conduct so that we can take into account librarians' concerns and points of view. Librarians are promoting media and information literacy tools and campaigns, and we hope we'll continue to do so. Libraries, as I mentioned before, are a great physical space for training in media and information literacy. And librarians have always been natural fact checkers in communities. I remember when I was a child going to the library, if I had a question and you know, the librarian was the person that I trusted to tell me the truth. And I think that role is extremely important in our lives. And then working locally with the UN on the ground, I know that many of our colleagues around the world in UN information centers and various UN offices work in local languages and cultures with libraries on really targeted um, incidents and working together to protect each other against mis and disinformation. And then what we're doing today, I think this sharing of best practices, case studies, hopefully using the guidance from our code of conduct as well, will help um, librarians to create and implement a systemic strategy on how we can deal with mis and disinformation together. So I see very much the UN and libraries as natural partners in this, really with shared values and shared interests in this. And this need to work together, I think is absolutely crucial because we are all impacted by this and we all need to work on it in order to make things better and find some concrete solutions from the ground up. So thank you. I'll take questions at the very end, I think of the session. Thank you so much uh, for sharing all this information, Sherry. Uh, I really uh, liked it, and you already uh, shared some of the aspects from uh, United Nations. Thank you so much. And I'm sure that you will get some questions at the end of the sessions. Uh, thank you. Uh, now our uh, next speaker is Greta. Uh, before leaving the floor to Greta, I would like to share her uh, short uh, bio with you. Greta, Greta uh, Kevelaitiene is the uh, vice president of the Lithuanian Librarians Association, director of Pane Veshi's County Gabriel Petkevice Te Bite Public Library. I hope cor uh, pronounce it correctly. And she is the media and information uh, literacy program coordinator and in Lithu Lithuania. Uh, the floor is yours, uh, Greta. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's a great honor to be among those uh, very uh, huge and important people uh, around me. Um, I'm glad that I can uh, present something for you from Lithuania. So please uh, let me know um, if you are able to see my screen. Yes, I can yes. see the... <laughs> So, um, first of all, um, I'm very thankful for the uh, pronunciation of my city, my country, and my surname. It's really difficult, and I am really appreciate it. Um, so, uh, last year, I shared something um, that we do in Lithuania, um, but it's really a big step uh, from last year to this year, and, and I'm really glad that I can share it with you. So media and information literacy activities are also in, in Lithuania, it's also in the library's hands. Uh, we now are acting not just as a public library, that was an intentional um, wish uh, in the first year, but uh, now we are in connection with the college libraries, um, audio sensory library, um, medical library, and also school libraries. So now we are calling the media information literacy activities just in Lithuanian libraries, not just in public libraries. And that's a huge um, step forward. So we have a logo that we are very proud of it. It's our mark that we are um, sharing all the activities with this mark and everybody knows it's about this program and about these values and last time i shared that we are part of a national um, safety program uh, we are encouraged by 
um, all kinds of ministries in Lithuania, um, foreign affairs, uh, national uh, safety and all kinds of uh, ministries. But from 2023 and September, you can see the date. It's very um, actually a very huge and difficult name um, of the program. But uh, short, it's uh, about civil resistance and the, this program that it's funded by um, Ministry of Culture, um, it's it has no ending right now because it's just a decision um, from the budget to give us the amount of money to provide all kinds of uh, activities in this um, in this field, and we are part of a uh, national strategy of uh, civil resistance, um, and we are playing a huge part of it. So um, two years ago, we started. Uh, from creating a program um, that we uh, were hoping that we will teach um, all 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 um, citizens of Lithuania um, about media information literacy, and we succeeded. We created that program. It's very open. Everyone can use it. Everyone can learn by themselves. But also, it's uh, used by um, librarians uh, who are teaching um, uh, their uh, citizen and their uh, members of the community uh, in the libraries. So we, uh, first of all, we trained librarians how to work with this program. It's we have five chapters, and it includes um, even um, um, dig digital intelligence and and all sorts of uh, AI things and uh, keeping your safe and the passwords and from ABC to really advance things that you can share or, or uh, experience on the internet. So we uh, taught about um, a thousand librarians in this in the last year. And by the end of the last year, we started to teach uh, public uh, members. And in public libraries, um, I think in two and a half months, um, there this program reached about 6,000 people in Lithuania by librarians. So um, every year we are planning to update this program by the newest information and keep on doing what we're doing um, all year long. So we are very fresh uh, by this program um, in the communities and it's very new for the librarians and who are just new members of, of, of libraries and we are trying more and more to uh, to share this um, information uh, with, with our communities. So quick uh, review uh, about the network of, of Lithuanian libraries. We have a lot of city libraries, village branches, and um, uh, just more than 1,000 libraries in, in Lithuania. Uh, and we also are celebrating uh, Media Information Literacy Week, uh, second year in the row. Um, for example, we tried um, in 2022, uh, we started with just a few um, uh, contact, uh, just meetings, and we did a lot of online. And uh, in 2023, we had more than 300 events in every, every library in the uh, country that did something in this week. It's um, last week of October. Um, and uh, a lot of national programs uh, were involved. For, for example, national TV show um, and the questions about media information literacy. Um, it's around Halloween, so we have a mill week events uh, on Halloween theme and about the safety on the internet. Uh, we had orientation hike uh, with the, some uh, questions along the way when you're hiking uh, about media information literacy. We had crosswords, we had uh, 
uh, meetings, we had games, we had escape rooms, we have all um, all the unusual um, formats for media information literacy during that week for people to engage more and not to, you know, we have a lot of people who doesn't feel like they need to know something more that they already know. They already know everything they need to know and they don't need any, any teaching conferences and nothing more. So we are trying from the game point of view to try to engage people in some activities. And one of my favorites are the cookie truck. Um, and this is um, about the cookies that we are accepting uh, when we are entering a website. And this is about uh, the cookies that uh, we can talk about. Uh, it's like a food truck, so it's a cookie truck. And inside we have people that are talking about the safety um, in, on the internet and we're actually giving out uh, cookies and they actually eat, <laughs> you can eat them. And on the uh, first uh, uh, theme uh, of the cookie, uh, we had um, a lot of discussions about how to engage a first sentence. And this is the sentence that it means um, uh, have you already got the email from um, some prince that you have inherited uh, some money from? Because we already have those emails, like every one of us. So we have to, something to talk about with everyone. And uh, yeah, it's a huge success. And we uh, this is from just a few weeks ago from Vilnius Book Fair that Cookie Truck was uh, in there and from the uh, youngest age, uh, all, the, all the games and with the parents, they are doing something about media information literacy. And it's very nice to talk about them um, with a theme that we can all share some interest about. And it's all because of the libraries in Lithuania. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Greta. It was a great presentation. I also really liked your idea, the cookie truck. I really liked it. <laughs> uh, okay, then. Uh, our uh, next and last speaker is Divina Mix. Uh, she's, uh, before leaving the uh, platform to her, I would like to share uh, her uh, short video with you. Divina is professor of media Soci sociology at Sorbonne Nouvelle University, France. She is a specialist of media and internet information literacy, cultural diversity, and internet governance. She is a worldly renowned researcher in the media uses and practices of young people, as well as information disorders, radicalization, disinformation, hate speech, and more. She holds the UNESCO chair, Savoye uh, Duvenier, in sustainable digital development, mastering information cultures. She is an expert with UNESCO MIL AI social media, the Council of Europe MIL digital citizenship education, and the European Union MIL digital education online disinformation. She is the author of more than 300 research articles, and more than 30 books among which the Handbook of Media Education Research and uh, Disinformation Debunked. She produced the policy brief on AI and MIL for UNESCO user emp empowerment through media and information literacy, the evolution of generative artificial intelligence. I also uh, really liked your YouTube uh, videos, Divina. The floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Grohl. Thank you, uh, Stephen um, and, and IFLA in general. Uh, I always think of uh, IFLA as a like-minded uh, uh, NGO because I, um, I've been a VP of uh, IMCR, the, uh, the the other uh, the UNESCO um, NGO with observer status uh, that represents uh, scholars and researchers um, in um, communication. Um, 
I think I am a champion of libraries in France as uh, elsewhere. In France, as you know, we have a, a mandate now for um, libraries to um, be the ones that impart uh, media and information literacy in schools and uh, elsewhere. Uh, and uh, I'm trying to push this idea through this notion of uh, transliteracy and the idea that information cultures are made of media, news, but documents, uh, which is uh, the remit of um, libraries and, and data, uh, which are creating a lot of uh, havoc. So I'm going to share with you the um, uh, my PowerPoint uh, um, that uh, is going to sum up a little bit uh, um, the uh, policy brief of UNESCO, maybe as a, as a fit, uh, thank you, Stephen, for this programming, uh, adding to uh, what has already been said uh, on mail, uh, but maybe adding the next step, which is AI. Um, I, I would say almost, uh, unfortunately, AI, because it's once more um, um, remixing everything that we thought we had more or less uh, gotten under control. Uh, but uh, AI, uh, like many other actors, is going rogue. Um, uh, you can ha I have access to the to the brief, so I'm going to go fast on some of the slides and stay longer on others. And of course, it will be available for for you to consult later. Um, the uh, the panic on AI, of course, is a panic about uh, human agency over information uh, and uh, quality and integrity of information, uh, because of course, information is crucial to decision making of all kinds. Uh, so. Um, it's a very important uh, topic, and I'm glad you're addressing it. The, um, the, the two panics that I think we have to deal with uh, are, are the ones about the uh, alleged intelligence of intelligence. And for me, um, uh, it's not intelligence. And it's more artificial information I would worry about than artificial intelligence. So maybe the I means something else. <laughs> and uh, artificial integrity is maybe a topic that we should address <laughs> eventually. Um, and also the uh, apocalyptic uh, statement uh, that we have been receiving uh, with this idea that uh, uh, we are in an arms race and that we are in existential risk. So this is huge. Uh, it's um, very um, bringing a lot of toxic content, a lot of uh, also toxic uh, thoughts into people uh, and especially young people. Um, the, uh, the way I, I go about it is um, to show that... Um, we are at this stage here in the evolution of a co-evolution between media and uh, AI, uh, because social media is what has enabled uh, AI to go generative in a way, or to go conversational in a way that is so advanced that it feels conversational. Uh, it feels that we can trust it. It feels like it's us talking. Uh, and as a result, we are now in an age where we are dealing with synthetic media, not just uh, social media, but also synthetic media. And I insist on it because I'm not sure that people are aware of how far that goes. Uh, synthetic media means media that are made by AIs without necessarily any reference to reality, either in the pictures or the themes. There's about 300 of them right now. Um, a lot of them do disinformation. They're ripping off about 5% uh, of the advertising manner online. So a threat to basically newspapers, uh, but also other entities that are that are depending on um, advertisement, for instance. Uh, and they are bound to grow. Um, as usual, when dealing with the UNESCO and the UN uh, world, uh, we are trying to look at opportunities and risks, not just risks only. Uh, sorry, Paul, but this is where I a little bit disagree about you uh, and the focus on countering disinformation. I think there should be also a huge focus on uh, pushing, amplifying quality information. Um, and um, I think that comes from research that shows a, a series of gaps, especially among librarians and teachers and educators and saying that uh, they need more training and, and Lithuania has been starting to address this. They need more uh, resources um, and, uh, and they need um, uh, design uh, advice uh, and guidelines. And so um, trying to think about how to come and help uh, in, a, in, a, in this way is what I, I've tried to do with uh, the UNESCO team. Uh, opportunities, I'm putting them there because they exist. <clears throat> and uh, especially in terms of inclusion, in terms of accessibility, um, potential participation, uh, synthetic media can help uh, creativity. And so you can see the areas of policy uh, here. 
Uh, and of course, everything that it does to uh, cross-referencing of sources, annotation, uh, putting this in because I know it touches, um, um, it makes it rings with uh, librarians that you are. Uh, in education, uh, there is this idea again of participation, contribution, um, closer attention to young people. The risks, I've mentioned them, I, I would like to insist on uh, concentration and monopoly, which are also uh, shrinking uh, pluralism and the risk of pluralism in information is a risk at integrity of information. Of course, disinformation, deep fakes, bias, because we know that uh, these uh, artificial intelligences are trained on the data um, and uh, research that um, uh, can carry its own uh, bias and uh, stereotypes. Election fraud, yes, everybody's uh, fear right now, and uh, things that uh, young people fear, which is the environmental footprint. Uh, so uh, because AI asks and requires even more uh, minerals, chips, data servers, all of this does contribute to climate change. In education, and that's the case for librarians, uh, we have a lot of problems, pseudoscience that is uh, invading us and, uh, and uh, really being dangerous for research and education, plagiarism and the loss of academic integrity for us, errors that are going to plague uh, the um, outputs by AI and being toxic and poisoning AI, working on AI, uh, this risk that suddenly uh, uh, there's going to be outgrowths of um, uh, self-poisoned uh, uh, content there. Source reliability, which for me is one of the big ones, and I come back to it in a minute. Uh, the fact that you, you cannot uh, be sure and trust uh, the full information life cycle, and that's really important for libraries. And of course, issues of intellectual property. Um, there, So that's for the, um, the, the problem. So once you've done the op opportunities and risks, then you can start seeing what and how to go about it. And what I propose with you, UNESCO, and I hope you'll follow me here, is that um, if teachers are not familiar with it, uh, don't feel that they have basic uh, know-how, et cetera, they will not engage with media literacy and AI. And so the idea uh, that I take from the transliter transliteracy approach, uh, which says that media, docs and data are now uh, commingling yeah, and are the ones that uh, hold and sustain a holistic view uh, of um, information cultures. Uh, um, transliteracy then uh, makes us say and consider, oh, hang on, uh, what we're seeing is an outgrowth of the data part. And uh, data are just as important as, al as algorithms, and generative AI cannot be understood and built upon without these two. So the idea is to consider that uh, we don't need a new discipline uh, from scratch or from STEM. We are in the sciences, social sciences, humanities, dealing with these issues for everyday use and for the empowerment of the everyday user, not for the next generation computers and computer scientists. And this is um, everybody's everyday uses. So in this sense, uh, we can build on mill and the principle of familiarity created by mill and add to this uh, the nested um, uh, AI uh, literacy. Always trying to bring in um, skills, and competences. Uh, we adopt the, the Council of Europe and, and now OECD approach of a butterfly of competences and with uh, skills as being only one, one part of a wing. Uh, so being operational is important, but not uh, only, but being able to curate and verify sources is, is key. Uh, but also uh, knowledge, uh, basic knowledge, because that makes people uh, feel confident that they recognize the players, their motivations, um, attitudes, because this is going to bring in a change, change in behavior, uh, change in uh, reactions. Uh, uh, Greta was talking about civil uh, resistance and personal resilience. This is where it shows. And, and, and values uh, that Sherry was mentioning uh, that remain still uh, extremely important and have to be part of this uh, butterfly. Uh, to add that a butterfly without a wing doesn't fly. 
So there we are, eh? having to deal with these two elements. And some of you have addressed the collective level of this uh, these competence frameworks eh? because uh, it empowers uh, people and citizens and to watch what is happening in AI policies and its governance. Eh? But also, of course, the personal level eh? of feeling trust eh? uh, in uh, partners in uh, third parties like libraries can be. Eh? And I hope they are, for instance, here in Europe with the um, AI Act coming up. Uh, so this trusted party idea of libraries uh, for me is as important as, as uh, the beacons uh, metaphor that uh, libraries have used for a while in the information world. In terms of design, uh, and here I'm, I'm, I'm reverberating some of the things you've been saying about uh, trust and, and how to go about it. Um, the main important things to, to me, and this is what can happen in libraries, uh, interact with non-human tools, how does one do it? Uh, how does one share experiences about it? Uh, when you're dealing with a, a robot that is your educator or that is your parent's uh, assistant for health, etc. How to make sure you don't over empathize, etc., etc. This is going to become a crucial part of media and information literacy and an additional specificity of this uh, AI-driven uh, um, approach. And for me, more importantly, is explicability, explainability, whatever it's called, uh, because um, it is uh, this uh, refusal from the part of citizens uh, of this message of the black box. Oh, it's a black box. We can't tell you what is in it, uh, etc. And what I keep telling people is um, when you're offered a can of soup and it just says, eat me, what do you do? Well, please don't be like Alice. That's what I'm, I'm responding. And expect, require consumer advice about what is in there, where it comes from, the quality data put inside, uh, the um, expected uh, calories, if you want, uh, in, of information, et cetera, et cetera. And I think uh, this is a metaphor that uh, users in their everyday life can carry over and and threaten these companies and say, well, you know, we won't buy your product. We can boycott it. We, we can find alternative. But more importantly for me, in terms of how we are, can be empowered with um, explainability, uh, it's this idea that if you provide information uh, to, to of what's in there um, to users, uh, they can then audit and you can they can ask third parties to do audits for them and eventually to ask for redress when there are torts and damages and that to me will then feed into transparency because everybody says that the word transparency doesn't work it's too large it's not concrete enough explainability when you start saying oh it's about evaluation and audits it's about redress etc people start to to listen and to pay attention especially policy makers so um that's where I, I have been with uh, the uh, policy brief. Now I'm departing with, for the policy brief or actually amplifying one of the recommendations I make at the end, you, and we'll come to this in a minute, to address your issue about integrity, yeah? the library sciences and uh, information sciences. To me, at the moment, there's two points uh, that need to be totally um, uh, addressed and, and clarified uh, and uh, sort of uh, to help uh, everybody be um, um, up to par with the big changes that are happening. There is, to me, in uh, this integrity question, data and sources. Because data is no longer what we used to call it data. And, and maybe we have to change names and maybe libraries are the ones who can propose that. Because the, the mom at the moment, the data we're using online are the contrary of what we used to know, which is to say a uh, selected and uh, representative sample of a given population. This is so 20th century, you want to die. Eh? What's really happening at the moment is that data are wildly scraped um, online. And because of their uh, speedy uh, and forceful uh, um, approach, huh? they have given to you uh, uh, volume and, and uh, velocity, etc. go there, uh, people tend to accept them as the truth, as representative, as quality. And we know they're biased. They're biased uh, in terms of research, in terms of language. Uh, so many countries are underrepresented. Talk to the, con the African continent and you'll see. Stereotypes, let's not talk about women, etc. Anyway, so uh, this is, data has to be 
unpacked differently again, uh, especially because we need to know the data in entry and we have to push for quality data to get out of uh, the toxic uh, moment in which we are and to um, make sure that the prediction uh, data that come out, uh, because they're all only prediction generative is predictive, nothing more, uh, and statistical, that that also has quality at the end. And what happens inside, it's okay. We don't need to know the full recipe of the soup, okay? But we have to know that we, if we eat it, we're not going to be poisoned. Um, and so uh, we do need uh, this, uh, this uh, technical information um, of, uh, about, about data to make sure about the integrity at entry, at exit. It has to come all together in a holistic way. And so I think uh, libraries uh, can have a word saying that because all data are then put into documents and the, the people who are the watchdogs of documents are the libraries, the documentation people, et cetera. So careful. And then, uh, and my slides are not moving. Yes, um, source, source integrity, because at the moment, again, sources are not what they used to be. Primary source, secondary source. Oh, this is so 20th century. Because what we have now is what, for lack of a better word, I'm calling tertiary sources. Sources that uh, build up on uh, citations and bibliographies that exist, but that are erroneous, truncated, uh, hallucinated, huh, because uh, ChatGPT and all the other AIs hate not being able to give an answer. So that when they don't have it, they invent it. So we have a, a, a prompt responses also that don't tell you um, if it's primary sources, uh, that don't respect copyright, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, we have this uh, this problem with sources that I call tertiary, that there's nothing to designate them as such. And they are synthetic. Some of them can be from synthetic media, which is to say we have zero reference to something that really existed. This is really problematic. So uh, we have to invent, uh, libraries have to invent a system to recognize and quote, in a way, tertiary sources, how they were generated, what prompts uh, led them, what traces, et cetera, et cetera, or else we we'll have we we'll run this risk of self-poisoning of AI by AI. And in there, a lot of garbage, a lot of toxic waste and content. So we are, this is an emergency. Uh, teachers, universities are paralyzed not to know which way to go, forbid AI, uh, go full, full blast AI without giving anybody uh, some guidelines. And so uh, it seems to me that this is the remit, full remit of uh, the library people. Data and source integrity are full part of uh, integrity. So I give a few uh, key messages, but uh, the one I want to finish uh, with um, is the 10 key recommendations for um, Mail and AI, in which, of course, this idea that it has to be put in the curriculum. The emergency is such that we need to have a full foundational approach to Mail and AI from K1 to K12, because everybody is uh, being impacted, and not just because of disinformation, but also because of the creativity dimension, because of the capacities to produce new knowledge and new content, and everybody should be allowed their curiosity, but trust their curiosity as well. So uh, it's very important to go there. Explainable AI standards, uh, you know what I mean by that by now. Uh, careful with the divide, because uh, gender divide is again there. Uh, and what I would like uh, to go with, and of course there is the, the UN oversight body on information and AI and uh, the body that Sherry uh, talks about that is working on the guidelines and it's, this is very good news. Huh? But um, uh, what I would like, and this is a direct um, uh, call on AI, uh, on, on IFLA, sorry, and a challenge maybe call it like that, tossing the gauntlet. Please, 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 organize some kind of major stakeholder consultation about source and data reliability and integrity. 
with civil society, with my beloved IMCR, but also IFLA, but also the Millet Network uh, of the network of UNESCO chairs on media literacy, of which I'm part of, uh, but also with the journalists who are also trying to figure out ways of um, uh, protecting uh, the integrity of their, their sources in a different way uh, so that we, we can have integrity of knowledge societies in the future. Thank you for your attention. You can go to, the, to these documents, huh, the, the policy brief that is going to be connected with the guidelines of the governance of digital platforms huh, by, by UNESCO. Please follow up on that. And as for Savoir de Venir, the chair and the association, we are lucky to have won a, a new project called uh, Algo Watch, uh, which um, is a project uh, that um, uh, is going to make sure that uh, young people uh, are... Um, AI watchers, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Divina, for your informative presentation. And I also would like to thank all the panelists uh, for using their uh, time efficiently. And as far as I noticed that there are some questions in the chat box, and I think the first two questions is addressed to you, uh, Sherry, uh, from Akash. Uh, we may start with you to answer these questions. Thank you, Erta Gruhl, and thank you for the, the question. So I see a question about libraries in India. Yeah, I understand that's correctly. right. Yes. So I think there are three questions. I think they're the same. Yeah, what is the UN doing about libraries in India? And yes. then it says the strategy regarding Indian libraries and information integrity. Yes, so I think it's right. the same question. Um, so basically, my answer to that would be the same thing as we would um, recommend to any libraries in the world. So some of which I I presented in my in my in my talk. So really, I think that librarians are a key actor in terms of media and information literacy, and can serve as a space where people can not only find reliable information, but actually to be trained in how to identify reliable information. Really even more key following what Davina had to say about AI and um, and the ways that libraries can be involved um, there as well. I think that there are some key issues that, that Davina um, spoke about, including the sources, et cetera, that could also be done by libraries. And then what I would say is that we do have quite a big information center, United Nations Information Center in Delhi. And so again, I do recommend that libraries work locally with the, the UN offices because we need to do this in local languages, adapt to local situations and um, customs. And so I think that that's really the way to go about this. So the recommendations are the same, but can be localized in cooperation um, with the UN, I think. Um, and then I saw that somebody put in the chat about a good example from Kenya. Did I see that? Yes, so I would just encourage everybody to take a look at that, that there are some really good examples of the UN working locally and that might inspire our friends in India as well. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much uh, for your uh, answers, Sherry. Actually, uh, there is a questions addressed to all the speakers, but uh, we have five only uh, five more minutes just uh, before uh, closing the sessions. Uh, I may ask uh, one or two of you to respond to these questions from Rolf Hahnemann. Uh, Paul, would you like to answer this question? And then uh, Divina, uh, Divin, sorry, Divina, would you like to answer these questions also? Can, can you find the question, Paul? Paul, should I yes. read it? Yes, is this about uh, preventing censorship? Yes, that's right. Yeah, um, like I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a practitioner in terms of the, uh, in terms of library practices and such. But I suppose I can only just give my own kind of personal experience in terms of working on this Please. strategy and and what is actually happening in Ireland at the moment. Um, and I was actually really taken by, um, uh, Davina's comments there about the soup can and blind trust in in what you are actually being told. Um, and I also think there is definitely a dilemma between the freedom of speech uh, rights and the freedom of reach. And I and I think that um, it's very careful. We need to be very careful about not inhibiting um, healthy exchange of ideas, while at the same time um, recognising that there are prescribed types of harm in terms of um, utterances around incitement to hatred, 
Uh, we have imminent hate speech legislation coming down the tracks in Ireland. So there is, and I think everyone is aware of that in terms of dealing with the disinformation um, problem, is that it, it is fine to express your opinion, but if you're expressing your opinion and it is loaded with um, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, or whatever it might be, th th there, there are legal prescriptions around those kinds of utterances and and I don't think any of the 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 the, the uh, aspects of of our uh, strategic development will 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 uh, disrupt that um delicate balance um uh, w the need for positivistic language is actually very very important and um I absolutely applaud Davina's um uh, you know, coverage of that as well. We need to support a healthy information environment, healthy exchange of ideas, but really focus on the healthy aspect of that. Thank you so much, Paul. Divina, uh, what's your opinion? Um, since it's uh, getting very close, I'm going to twist the, the answer, the question to, <laughs> into an answer. Uh, no, I mean, because I'm not going to address the censorship directly. Uh, what I... What I'm seeing uh, as an option, and especially for libraries, and that's what I've been saying to journalists, and journalists are doing it. If you want quality information without censoring it, but quality information that shows the possible potential of dialogue, contradiction, uh, healthy, if you want, uh, um, content uh, debate, uh, my uh, suggestion is uh, to have IFLA, or all libraries in the world, pull together all their resources, nothing else, all their resources, because they are tried and true, and have an AI curator go through them, retrieve things that have been uh, buried away from three or four or five centuries back, uh, do um, uh, exhibits if they want, huh? uh, always with a curator, uh, so that uh, you know that you're working with your treasure, and that all aspects of a treasure are being uh, uh, updated, uh, uh, seen, uh, uh, admired, et cetera, et cetera. And that way, we can regain a little bit of ag agencies as actors, as, as uh, librarians for you, as educators for us. Journalists are doing the same thing. A, a major consortium of reference journalists are pulling together all the archives of their um, uh, journal newspapers and training an AI on using that to produce content, including AI content. And so I, I wouldn't say let's let's use AI as a tool, not an agent, not a human, nothing like that, a tool for uh, showing even better the, the wealth of content, of quality content that we have accumulated over time and mine it to produce maybe even more knowledge or even more uh, content, including AI and MIL courses. But with uh, the full knowledge for us that the quality data at entry are is guaranteed and therefore we can expect quality data at exit. That's what I'll say. Thank you so much. Uh, the, uh, actually, there are uh, several thank messages in the chat box, but uh, there is one more question uh, from Anushka Yadav. Uh, Sherry, maybe you would like to answer this question. Uh, the question is, what's online information systems and information networks? That's quite a technical question. <laughs> 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 well, I think it's, I mean, somebody might be better placed than I am to answer that. I mean, for me, it's all the, a network of all the platforms. Um, it's information systems. So it's things that are connected online. Um, so we, I, the connections between Google and YouTube and Facebook and how they're interconnected, I think, and managed by the Digital Markets Act would be my yeah. answer. But perhaps somebody has a better one and understands that better than I do that terminology. Okay. Is there any one who wants to answer this question? Maybe it's not to address any of uh, our panelists. Okay. Uh, I checked uh, the chat box one more time. There is no more question. There are several thank messages to you all. I also would like to thank you all uh, for your informative uh, messages, uh, presentations, and for your uh, valuable con contributions. 
And uh, just before closing the sessions, uh, session, uh, I want to say that hope to see you all in another IFLA meeting, even in online or in person. Thank you for joining us today. Hope to see you. Bye-bye.